afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm glad to see y'all out today on this Wednesday, our last noon Holy Week service today. Thank you for your support of these services this week. We've had some good, good services, and I appreciate your attendance and your support of that. Uh, just a few things to go over, and uh, most of which you already know what they are, but. Um, Remember, tomorrow night will be our Monday, Thursday uh, communion service, and uh, we'll gather here at 7 o'clock and go through that service. We'll offer you the self-contained communion elements that you can take at your seat. Next week, we will be back with our midweek faith lift that we continue to do on Wednesdays at noon. And uh, I want you to remember, too, to be in prayer about what God is leading you uh, to do for our Lenten offering uh, this year. Our Lenten offering will be in support of the Wesley College at Tanzania. Church and youth have challenged us to save $40 a dollar for each day in Lent. And uh, if you'd like to accept that challenge, we should be able to make a fairly significant offering uh, to that college and help some of those students get their tuition, perhaps room and board paid for. I know that they would appreciate that. Also, our Easter special offering, an above tithe offering in prayer, what God may be leading you to do there as well. Um, we have some upcoming meetings uh, coming up very soon. The Finance Committee is going to be meeting uh, next Monday at 6.30 in Williams Hall. Uh, trustees are going to be meeting on April the 6th, that Tuesday, uh, at 6 o'clock in Williams Hall. Staff Parish will be meeting on April the 13th at 6.30 p.m. in Williams Hall. And our Administrative Council will be meeting on April the 19th at 6.30 p.m. An announcement from our children and youth that Easter baskets are being delivered to our children and teens on Friday and Saturday. If you'd like your child or grandchild to be a part of this ministry, you can text or email Debbie Clifton or Missy Young. If you need those phone numbers or addresses, we can get those for you through the church office. Excuse me. Are there any other announcements this morning? All right, if nothing else, if you'd stand and join me for our call to worship. <clears throat> Let us draw near to the presence of God. Let us call on the name of the Lord. For the day dawn, when we shall be called the Savior, when each heart that has been broken by the arm of sin shall be bound up and healed by the hand of salvation. Our hymn for this afternoon is O Sacred Head, Now Wounded. We'll sing all verses. <laughs>
Let us pray. Almighty God, who is always readier to hear than we are to pray, and who is always ready to give graciously to us, though we are undeserving, we give you thanks for your generous mercy, for forgiving us when we live by our own agendas, rather than pursuing matters of justice and fairness, and for the grace which adds blessings to our lives each and every day. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, each day this week we have taken opportunity to uh, give a glowing and flowery introduction to our speaker. And since I'm the speaker, I'm going to do that on my own behalf. Because, I mean, you know, what else can you add? I mean, just look who's up here today. <laughs> Wasn't easy getting me to be the speaker today. I had to call myself three times before I agreed. And then, you know, I'm, I'm trying to give Rodney time to get to the piano over here. But uh, anyway, when I found out that not only would I have to be speaking today, but found out that I would also have to provide special music, I insisted for myself that I had paid more. So that's the way that's going to go. Today we're going to do a very special song, one we hadn't done in a long time. And this has become one of my favorites over the years. <coughs> and uh, we all know it. And so if you would like to help us out on it, feel free to, to do so. Uh, but when uh, Rodney and I were talking earlier today, we were trying to come up with something that we felt like would, uh, would be a good song that we could offer that we were both familiar with and that you were familiar with. And so we chose Spirit Song. Yeah. 
know, when I was looking around at uh, what is a scripture that really sort of brings uh, this part of the week uh, to either an end or a culmination? And it's, it, it's hard to decide which one. But uh, I actually chose a passage of scripture that I have never preached on before. And if not careful, we sort of overlook it. Uh, but this is uh, from John's Gospel, beginning with the 21st verse, reading down through the 32nd verse. And this picks up on the Last Supper and where Jesus reveals that he knows there is a betrayer among them. Now, we know who that is, of course, and so we're going to read today from John's Gospel, the 13th chapter, verses 21 through 32. So hear the word of the Lord. After saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, Very truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. And so while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is he? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Iscari. After he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, Do quickly what you are going to do. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Judas, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the, for the festival. Or that he should give him something, or should give something to the poor. So, after receiving the piece of bread, he, that would be Judas, immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him once. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, John's gospel gives us a, a look at the life of Jesus in, in sort of a little deeper theological context, if you will. Uh, John's gospel gives sort of a, a greater understanding of God's love. If you will, the, the, the hope of everlasting life and, and brings the fullness and, and the passion of Jesus Christ right sort of in our faces, if you will. John, of course, was a very zealous and devoted man while he was a follower of Jesus. Uh, he wanted to call down fire and brimstone on the village that would not receive them and other examples of, of his passion. Uh, he was not immune to error and sin like any of us. He was also a part of Jesus' inner circle. When Jesus took some of his disciples apart, John was always a part of that group, usually the three of them, Peter, James, and John. And you will remember, as Jesus is hanging on the cross, Jesus looks down into the crowd he sees his mother, and then he sees John, and he tells John, take this woman as your mother, which means take care of her on my behalf. So it's, it's this John, this St. John, that gives us the gospel, that bears his name, and gives us his passage, which deals with the betrayal of Jesus by Judas, because all of the Gospels have at least something to say about this. So what I want to talk about today is betrayal. And, and that just 
so glared up at me when I read this passage of scripture. I knew for myself, at least, it, it really couldn't be about anything else. And so Jesus and the disciples are sitting at the table. They're feasting in the, in the traditional meal, the Seder meal, or the Last Supper as we know it. Uh, and it's during this meal time that Jesus... It's, it's really kind of hard to understand, and, and I don't think anybody's interpretation is wrong. So however you see this unfolding, you're probably right when Jesus reveals that someone is going to betray. Now, was, was that something that John and Peter heard? Was it something that the whole table heard? It's, it's really a little unclear, but however you want to interpret that. Uh, and, and I'm not sure that when Jesus said that, that someone is is one of you is going to betray me that that the disciples were really even ready to hear something like that i mean they're celebrating jesus has washed their feet they're they're having a meal together and now all of a sudden we we break out this this bad news and he's talking about betrayal and apparently that betrayal has to do with at least one of them that's sitting there at the table with the rest of them and so I sort of thought to myself, well, who, who, when the disciples heard that, what kinds of questions would be running through their minds? What, what sort of issues would they be grappling with? And I thought, you know, uh, betrayal? Okay, if, if I'm sitting down at the other end of the table and I, I just kind of hear the term betrayal come up, I'm thinking to myself, what, what is he even talking about? What is Jesus talking about? And if they're taking that serious, they're probably wondering inside of themselves, betrayal. Well, could, could Jesus be talking about me? But you know, 11, 11 of them have alibis when it comes to betrayal. 11 of them didn't do it. Only one. And in this biblical example of betrayal, hear this, because this struck me too. Betrayal here refers to actions that are already in motion. Not something that's going to happen that hasn't happened yet, but this is something that is already in play. And that's the difference in what Jesus says and how the disciples take the news. It doesn't refer to actions that haven't taken place yet. Well, am I going to be the one to betray? Jesus is talking about actions that are already in motion. If I were to ask you, give me two names that you can come up with that remind you and that you think of when you think of betrayal what two names might you come up with Judas, Judas yes in our country think of history Benedict Arnold Benedict see this side they, they've been elevated to this Benedict Arnold. That's what I thought. I thought Judas, and when I think about betrayal, I mean, is there some sort of example that I could use and I could think of that would make that real for me? And of course, when we study history of our own country, that's one name that sort of surfaces for us is, is Benedict Arnold. Uh, bear with me, folks. Uh, I like to do this every now and then, and y'all get tired of it. I'm sorry. Uh, Benedict Arnold actually joined the American, the Connecticut militia when he was 16 years old um, during the French and Indian War. And, and he pretty quickly established himself as a, a deep thinker and a really competent military strategist, even at such a young age. And then when the Revolutionary War broke out, he was sort of moved to the top for military leadership. Again, still at, at a relative young, a relatively young age. And during the Revolutionary War, Arnold began to distinguish himself uh, with demonstrating 
courage in battle and and his ability to think on the battlefield and, and his intelligence as it related to uh, war strategy. Uh, he early on began to feel like well, others were getting credit for things that he had actually done. And he began to see some of his fellow officers being promoted while his career sort of languished. And in the meantime, uh, he, uh, he began courting a lady by the name of Peggy Shippen. Uh, Peggy Shippen's family were pretty well known to be British sympathizers. And after their marriage, his wife, Peggy Shippen, introduced Benedict to a man named Major John Andre. And it was Andre who eventually turned Benedict Arnold into a spy for Britain. But you know, there was one military leader who really believed in Benedict Arnold's ability and he decided to give him what he felt was a well-deserved promotion and so General George Washington promoted Benedict Arnold as the commander of West Point in New York and what Washington could not have known is that betrayal of the American militia, American militia, betrayal was already in force, was already in motion. And so plans for the takeover of West Point had been engineered by Major General Benedict Arnold, had been given to his newfound friend, if you will, and compatriot, uh, Major John Andrade to pass up through the ranks of the British Army. But on September 3rd, 1780, John Andre was captured by three privates in the New York militia and papers on how to take West Point that had been signed by Major General Benedict Arnold were discovered on Andre's person in his boot. Why do people betray? Sometimes it's idealism, sometimes it's just for money and personal gain. In this situation, the best we can come up with in, in Benedict Arnold's situation was just money and gain. I didn't know this, but the British Army had offered Benedict Arnold for his act of treason to pay him the sum of today what would be the equivalent of about $2.5 million. Well, when it was discovered and he knew that he had been discovered, he escaped to the British forces and was given a commission in the British Army. He eventually died in London as a rather despised citizen. And you know, I think what drove him was that he felt like, well, Britain has the capability of toppling this American Revolution, and if they do, I want to position, position myself to where I can gain from that. And what's interesting is that he did that even though he himself had won the most decisive battle for America against the British at Saratoga. But in the end, he still betrayed his country. Now folks, I know that was a bit lengthy, but what I want to demonstrate by the illustrations I'm going to offer you today is that betrayal can have treasonous roots behind it or mindsets that don't just happen overnight. And when you consider Judas, here was a man that was from the area of Kerioth. Kerioth was just a few miles south of Judea. 
the thing that's interesting about this particular area is that over its history it was known to harbor a lot of insurrectionists and people that hated the fact that they were under Roman oppression. They hated the Roman tyranny and they did whatever they could to try to marshal up troops and lead some sort of overthrow or at least get rid of the Roman presence in their area. And so there were a lot of, of people killed in that area because of the insurrection that continually went on there. And that's where <coughs> Judas is from. This is where he has plucked out uh, this... Uh, this area known for its insurrection. It's believed by some that Judas saw in Jesus a man who could successfully lead a revolt, if you will, which could eventually overturn this Roman oppression. And again, some feel that as a way to get Jesus to act, Judas attempts to stir the pot by giving Jesus up to the Sanhedrin, hoping that this would anger him, Jesus, to the point that he felt like he needed to take some sort of action and lead some sort of rebellion. Well, we know that that did not and was not going to happen, and Judas figured that out. Too, but it was too late and we remember the story of how he was paid for his betrayal he went and tried to give the money back but it was it was too late by then and they would have none of it Judas throws the money down on the steps of the temple and goes out and then ends his life you know Judas realizes that Jesus is God's missionary to his own people. And Jesus could be successful in leading a rebellion, in overturning Rome. That's exactly what Jesus did. It took a few hundred years to do it. And his followers to lead that cause and continue the mission of Jesus, but it eventually did happen, but it happened through love rather than conquest. And you know, there that night, in that upper room, all of this is known to Jesus. Jesus knows exactly what's, what's going on at this Last Supper, this, this Seder meal. Jesus reveals to Judas that his plans are known to him and if he's going to go through with them get up now go get it over with get it done and so to us there will always be a question of whether Judas betrayal was was purely a selfish act for money or was it an act meant to force Jesus to act in a way Judas felt that it was in the best interest of his people. <laughs> There's so much speculation about why Judas was chosen by Jesus in the first place. If Jesus could have known these things, then why would Jesus pick someone like Judas to be a part of the disciples. Now, I thought about that quite a bit, and, and something came to mind that I remember that I've said again and again, and you've heard again and again from others, not just uh, from me, but that Jesus did not choose his followers based on who they were, but Jesus chose his followers based on who they could become. And I think Jesus knew Judas was a man of great passion. That Judas was a thinker. He was someone who would act given the chance. You know, when you think about it, these are all really great attributes of a leader. These are, these are great leadership qualities. And so perhaps Jesus felt 
then Judas, if he could buy into his mission at 100%, he would make a great leader in the early church. You know, I, I want to add a word here now that even by my own admission could be heard a little harsh. But I, I think to myself because we have now been a little more than a year in this COVID pandemic. And I know we all don't, all don't share the same views of, of what this has meant. But anyway, I, I, I think even now as COVID seems to be getting pushed back a little bit. I think back to when this virus first had its run. And there were people, me among them, who, who really didn't want to give it the respect early on that I think it probably needed. And so some people who were, as we say, asymptomatic, didn't even know they had it, carried the virus and infected others, some of whom eventually did die from the disease. Now, I say this as today we sit around that table with Jesus and the disciples who have just heard the news. Someone here is a betrayer. Someone here is going to betray me. Three years ago, <clears throat> when we presented the Holy Week drama, uh, the, Lord, the Last Supper, you remember that? It was very well received and very well done from our church, too. If you remember the monologues that each of the disciples had, how it ended, and it always ended with the disciples looking over to Jesus at whatever point he was from where they were sitting and asking that question. Is it I, Lord? Is it I, and so, based on that notion, I know there must be people who discovered that, in fact, they were asymptomatic and, and who saw either loved ones or close friends get sick, perhaps die with the virus. And so they had to ask themselves, how did they contract it? Was it I? Did my own disbelief in what was happening betray those I loved most? Well, that's on a very human level. But we can also look at things from a deeply spiritual level as well. You know, I, I have to ask myself, is it I, Lord? Is it I? Because when, when I took Jesus as my Savior and made Jesus Lord of my life, I did so fully, fully intending to espouse all of the values that Jesus stood for and that I saw in Jesus Christ. And I did that with the full intention of leading the kind of life that I knew Jesus expected from his followers. I said yes to all of those. And I knew what that looked like. It looked like feeding the hungry and, and acting justly towards all human beings and, and demonstrating compassion for those who need to be cared for. Sharing my faith when the opportunity presented itself. And, and, and so many others. That's, that's just too numerous to mention. But I remember saying yes to all of that, fully intending to live up to it every day, every moment of my life. But you know, I have to say in all honesty that my faith my acts of kindness and my good intentions often betray 
Jesus. The three simple rules prove to be difficult time and time again. Do good. Do no harm. Stay in love with Jesus Christ. Now, if we look at ourselves in that light, sometimes we don't get the most glowing picture. I know I don't. And so, let me end by pointing to another betrayer. And, and it's a betrayer that a lot of times we, we tend to let off the hook. And it's Simon Peter. And you remember what Simon said to Jesus, looked him in the eye and declared, Lord, even if I must die, I will never deny you. Denial can be a form of betrayal. Even if I must die, I will never, never deny you. And you remember what Jesus said to Peter. Peter, let me tell you, even before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Well, if we stop there, that's one thing. But, but it doesn't stop there, does it? Because we know there's a larger lesson here, isn't there? There's, there's a larger lesson because Peter, you see, he realized his mistakes. And Peter recognized his own acts of betrayal. But the difference between he and Judas is Peter sought forgiveness. And the lesson is that when we seek forgiveness for our own acts of betrayal or denial or our acts of sinfulness or the shortcomings that we know are not in the will of God, that forgiveness is always available. And forgiveness is is always available. You see, absolution can be achieved through our penitent acts. And, and that's what Peter teaches us about acts of betrayal and confession. And so let us always remember that old saying, Keep this in your heart. There is more grace in God than there is sin or betrayal in me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Folks, thank you for being here during these midweek noon Holy Week services this week. Uh, it's been a special time. This has not been an easy time for any of us. and We have to weigh uh, whether or not we want to be out, whether we can be out. And you've made those decisions. And, uh, you've been here to celebrate with us as a church in this Holy Week time. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, remember tomorrow night we come back for our Monday, Thursday communion service will be at 7 o'clock here in the service. That is a somber service, and so at the conclusion of it, we will leave in silence. Today, I would ask you that we do respect each other and try to limit our contact. And if you'd like to uh, greet each other and carry on conversations, that should be done in the parking lot. This time, would you stand and join me for our benediction? Now the God, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself 
restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. And so to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And you're dismissed. <laughs>